My name is Dustin Miller. I'm the director for the Idaho Department of Lands. Idaho is experiencing severe drought and unprecedented fire conditions across most of the state. Extreme fire conditions are at an all-time high and weather forecasts indicate, indicate no relief in the weeks ahead. <laughs> Suppression resources across the west are already stretched thin. On lands under the protection of the Idaho Department of Lands and other agencies, multiple fires following an early July lightning event have contributed to a significant shortage of fire suppression resources across the region. In response to this situation, Governor Little issued an emergency disaster de declaration across all lands protected by the Idaho Department of Lands and the Timber Protection Associations, enabling the Idaho National Guard to assist the state in fire suppression efforts and related activities. Governor, I know you will speak further to this, but on behalf of the Idaho Department of Lands, we greatly appreciate your leadership and commitment to working with us to get the necessary resources to combat these wildfires this season. Fighting wildfires across the West requires a well-coordinated effort amongst federal, state, local, and tribal entities. And we greatly appreciate the significant role that the National Interagency Fire Center plays in these efforts. The safety of our firefighters is the top priority. And just like any other fire season, fire managers will continue to monitor, monitor firefighter safety and fatigue. This is extremely important. As we all know, we are in for a very long and hard fire season. I will now turn the time over to the governor to provide a few remarks on the current fire situation in Idaho, and then uh, followed by Josh Harvey, Fire Management Bureau Chief for the Idaho Department of Lands, and then Grant Beebe with the National Interagency Fire Center. So, Governor. Thank you, thank you, Director, and uh, thank you all. You know, we in the last year or so, we've been pretty fortunate. Uh, we know our sister states around the West have had pretty catastrophic fires, and and we've been fortunate, but the magnitude of this extreme drought that we have this year, and the fact that it's everywhere, if you look at the drought map, it goes from the Canadian border all the way down there, getting some monsoons in Arizona and New Mexico right now, but the percent of the West that's under extreme drought, extreme dry conditions is almost unheard of. Colorado, Utah, Nevada, Montana, Wyoming, uh, Idaho, Oregon and Washington and of course California and of course every one of those states has as we do here in Idaho has uh, federal partners but the way our fire system works and of course we're standing on a piece of real estate that epitomizes that is on the federal level we coordinate all those resources and and this great facility that we're very blessed to have here in Idaho is a big part of that but as as uh, Director Miller said uh, last week when I asked the National Guard, uh, the reason we did that, and we don't do that lightly, was because of the, of the crush of demands on the resources at the federal level. Uh, uh, I know in North Dakota, uh, Governor Burgum in North Dakota called out the National Guard almost two months ago on a fire. And uh, we were hopeful we would not have to, but given the uh, complexity of these fires, uh, some of the other issues that are out there, we we figured there was absolutely the right time to do that, even though it's the first time. Our land managers, whether they be the State Department of Lands, our federal partners, the Forest Service and the BLM, and all the federal partners, our local uh, uh, firefighters, uh, mainly volunteers, and all the other people, uh, we spend all year a lot of time uh, coordinating uh, what we do at the at the uh, state and national level to make sure most importantly we keep uh, our firefighters safe and secondly that we uh, do all we can to suppress these fires simultaneously uh, we do a lot of prevention whether it's uh, what we're doing with our federal partners on forest health projects what we're doing on the state level uh, you know, everybody in Idaho knows uh, some of the conditions that people have <clears throat> at their own homes and, and uh, farms and ranches and timberlands about what we need to do. Uh, that's going to be even more important. I just, when these managers start doing these closures, I ask everyone in Idaho to be respectful of it, to be conscious uh, that what they do as far as complying with the closures is what's going to make 
uh, us keep Idaho safe, keep your community safe, uh, and and basically uh, minimize the amount of smoke we have in the air. I didn't actually ask for this smoke today uh, to get our point across, and I would add that a lot of this smoke's coming from Oregon, so uh, Governor Brown, take care of your smoke. Uh, but we're gonna have it here in Idaho. We just, you know, it's early for the fire season. We know we're gonna have a big fire season, and I want people to stay safe, but I also want them to comply uh, with the requests of their local land managers because of what kind of a difference that makes uh, for everyone. Uh, you know, preventing a fire uh, right up here on the Boise front means there's going to be resources to save somebody's property, somebody's life, somebody's favorite fishing spot, hunting spot, and more important, uh, to keep these big fires down and in control. So uh, this is going <laughs> to... I'm afraid this is not going to be our first, our last press conference on this, but we want the people of Idaho to know how important it is for them to do their prevention and to comply with these uh, closures by these land managers. So with that, Josh, you want to come up here and tell them about the Idaho Department of Lands. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks, Governor, for that introduction. Like you said, my name is Josh Harvey. I'm the Fire Management Chief for the Idaho Department of Lands. Uh, a little update on where we're currently at across the state. The Department of Lands has responded to 202 fires uh, across our 10 districts. This number is 221 percent of our all-time record. I expect this number to increase as reporting becomes more accurate over the course of the next few days and weeks after that last lightning event that we, we received. All of our districts are at very high to extreme fire danger. Within the Northern Rockies geographic area, the preparedness level, which is the highest, is five. Five is our highest level. Nationally, we're at a preparedness level of four. Among, along with the numerous small active fires across the state, Idaho has 10 large incidents currently being managed by incident management teams. Five of those incidents are individual fires being managed by themselves. Five of those incidents are complexes, which means there's several or more fires within that incident management team span of control. These fires range from type 1, type 2, and type 3 incidents, as well as a smattering of unstaffed smaller incidents out across some of our remote, more remote areas in our districts and forests. For, for the IDL, within our direct protection, the uh, large fires that we have are as follows. The Leland Complex, which com consists of three different fires, on the Ponderosa District is approximately 1,450 acres, with the Sand Mountain Fire in that complex being 900 acres. The Cougar Rock Complex on the Clearwater Potlatch Timber Protection Association uh, included 17 fires and is listed at 2,500 acres, but there are still fires in that area that are unstaffed due to lack of resources. The Snake River Complex, which is the largest, was three fires that all grew together on the Salmon River and in, in Hell's Canyon off the Snake River. And as of this morning, it was 88,000 acres, but is expected to grow uh, over the course of the next few days. There are evacuations in place for the Waha and Redbird areas. All of these fires are in steep, rugged terrain. Uh, access is extremely limited. Extremely dry, heavy fuels are contributing to, to rapid fire growth, making these fires very resistant to suppression efforts. We're seeing historically unprecedented fire conditions in our state, statewide. We have met or exceeded nearly all metrics available related to fire danger and potential for significant fire growth and spread for this time of year. The extended high temperatures and lack of spring moisture has led to historic lows in our, in our, in our fuel moistures. Many of these indicators reflect conditions that we would normally see in mid or late August, not only for Idaho, but across the West. The Department of Lands works very closely with our interagency partners, the Forest Service, the BLM, and the tribe, as was mentioned earlier, as well as our neighboring states, Washington, Oregon, Montana, and to some extent, our Canadian folks, our Canadian friends to the North. <clears throat> National effort is underway where there is a severe shortage of crews, engines, overhead staff and logistical support 
and trying to staff and support these fires. Coordination between all those, all the above agencies that I mentioned is, is ongoing and occurring almost on a nightly basis. I'm very thankful to Governor Little for the emergency declaration and the quick response that we've received from the National Guard and their support. We'll be putting those resources to work as soon as they are, as soon as they are available. I got to echo what Governor Little just mentioned about minimizing the risk of fire from human caused starts. When the citizens of Idaho are out playing in the woods or working in the woods, please use extreme caution. Think before you do, know where you're at. If you want to protect our firefighters and take care of your neighbors, be extremely careful. Thank you very much. Well, it's almost like we uh, compared notes before we talked, but I'm going to echo some of the themes that have already been brought up. Uh, one, interagency cooperation. Uh, super grateful that the governor, Dustin, Josh came by today to, to have this message to folks in Idaho. Just say we echo that same message to everybody in the nation. I want to point out that uh, uh, we have many of our interagency partners here today, and it's not by special invitation. They're here all the time. But, uh, but for one, I want to call out John Roos, the state director from uh, BLM Idaho. John's only got a couple weeks left. And uh, he's responsible for a lot of the land in Idaho that's uh, being managed for fire danger these days. So um, John taught a lot of us everything we know about, about lands and fire, and we're gonna miss John. But uh, Beth Lund from the Forest Service here, I toured Bitterboro from uh, US Fire Administration, Jim Carls from the National Association of State Foresters, Chris Wilcox from US Fish and Wildlife Service, Bodie Shaw from the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and I'm probably missing somebody else. These folks are here every day managing fire across boundaries, as the governor pointed out. Smoke doesn't stop at the borders, neither does fire. It doesn't stop at land jurisdiction boundaries. It doesn't stop at state borders or national or international borders. So we're all in this together. Nobody's got enough to manage things on their own. We count on the help of our friends and our compatriots and, uh, and sometimes our international cooperators. So that's the way fire is managed. This place has been here 50 years, and I'm, I'm proud to say that I'm the, the latest in a whole line of directors here. John preceded me. But uh, we know across this nation this is how we manage fire state partners, national partners, federal partners, county, private citizens all together. And uh, I guess we're here to say that we're in this together this year. It's going to be a tough year, but we'll make it through. Um, so uh, I'll just say that we all have the same priority. We need to uh, manage for protection of lives and livelihoods, protect property, treasured natural, natural and national resources. Uh, we all have the same mission, but mostly we want folks to come home at the end of the day. That's a number one priority. Make sure everybody gets home at the end of the day. Uh, as Josh said, we expect these conditions to continue for another couple of months. You guys are probably all uh, looking at the Weather Channel the same way we are and we don't see a break. Uh, we've got about 12,000 firefighters out on the line now. We know we can mobilize many thousands more, but they're gonna be on the lines for a long time. And one of our missions right now is make sure people can make it to the end of the year with their sanity intact. So uh, we're, we're managing people's well-being as well as managing fires. We're working across, um, across the borders with all of our partners here, trying to get firefighting resources to where they're most needed. So that's our job here at the National Fire Center is to look, see who needs help, and to redirect resources from, from where they're not needed to where they are needed. That's what we're doing every day. That's what these folks are doing every day. And that's our mission. We're proud to deliver on that mission day in and day out. Uh, I would like to take a minute right now to note that uh, a couple of our firefighters aren't with us anymore. They died over the weekend. So Matthew Miller, Jeff Batura, uh, two folks on an air attack plane died in Arizona uh, just a few days ago. So Saturday on a BLM fire in Arizona. Uh, I bring those up is because, uh, you know, they're not the first wildland firefighters who died this year. We sure hope that they're the last ones who died this year, but that's our mission to bring everybody home. And, and I'll say that the public has a responsibility to help us with that, to help bring everybody home. And Josh just brought it up. Uh, prevent fires that are preventable. So careful when you recreate, careful with your fires, careful with your vehicles, careful with your UTVs. Every fire that doesn't start is a fire that we don't have to send resources to and we can concentrate on the work at hand. So if we could say one thing to the public, help us help you prevent anything that's preventable, be careful. Recreate and have fun, but be responsible with it. Thank you very much. Okay, questions. Governor, would you step in and have the prepare the National Guard just in case we run out of resources? Well, we did. That's And I talked to General Garshak last week about it. And uh, 
the, the Blackhawk helicopters that are just deployed across the runway here. Uh, we've got, how many of those have we got, Josh, now? We've got two that are on the move today and two more that'll be in service in the next couple of days. Yep, and that's why I said, I know that uh, Governor Burgum in North Dakota, I think like a month and a half or two months ago deployed them. I, I was hopeful we would not have to, but given the magnitude of the footprint of the drought and the extreme fire condition, I think it's really, there's no question it's an all hands on deck. And the National Guard is, is uh, you know, that's, that's what they do. They show up, uh, we, we've just got them off of the front lines of doing uh, COVID testing and vaccination. And, and of course, this is a different crew, but we've got these Blackhawks that are right across here and uh, they'll be they'll be putting water, putting fire out right away. Mostly logistics at this point in time. Uh, we're training some of them. Josh, do you want to add on to that? But it's mainly logistics. It's if we've got trained firefighters, professional firefighters, we want them to be fighting fire and we'll let the National Guard help with the logistics. Yep. Josh is nodding yes. Currently there's uh, 20 guardsmen that are trained up to basic wildland fire st uh, statter standards. We'll be providing fire line leadership for them as soon as we can find it and be deploying those folks out. The rest of the guardsmen we're going to enlist in, in serving in the fire cache and doing other tasks. Basically the guys getting the beans and bullets out to the folks on the ground. Yeah, one, one of the issues we had, the uh, department had, was our cash, which is our supplies up at Coeur d'Alene. They were desperately looking for help and the National Guard was just what they needed because they handled the logistics of getting supplies out to the fires. Keith? In some ways this news conference seems similar to the, the start of the pandemic where we're asking- <laughs> No, about, I hope not. We're asking Idaho residents to help out. This time it's not starting fires. How, how important is that considering it, most fire- Well, you know, I think Grant did a good job of talking about it. It, you know, whatever your behavior is when you're out, whether it's on private land or public land, uh, you need to amp it up because of the risk. It, it is similar, you know, in the, in the pandemic, we we're worried about hospital capacity, that we'd have enough hospital capacity. Here, we're really worried about professional firefighter capacity. And there's only so much hospital capacity and only so much firefighter capacity. That's why I called out the National Guard, but that's why we need people to take individual responsibility and do the right thing uh, so that we don't have uh, any more fires than, you know, there's always gonna be some natural, there's gonna be some lightning, there's gonna be automobile accidents and other accidents that cause fire. All those ones that are just a slip of the mind or maybe not good behavior we need to tamp those way down so we can save the capacity we have with these uh, with our firefighting resources well my fear is that we'll have some of these great big mega fires that start creating their own weather like the one that's over in oregon where i think a lot of this smoke's coming from uh, that basically they endangered community they endanger firefighters they endanger precious wildlife and watershed capacity, those big, huge fires that start creating their own weather, and then they gobble up all the resources for a, you know, a fire that could start right up here on the Boise front and, and uh, jeopardize a lot of homes and a lot of people. You bet. Yeah. Uh, so we we have um, become aware of that problem over the last couple of weeks. Uh, we've heard of it sporadically in Eastern Oregon, for instance, where uh, some of the smaller fixed base operators, the folks who supply uh, jet fuel to aircraft, firefighting aircraft, have run out of fuel. Um, some of it has to do with getting fuel from the end of a, the end of a pipeline to a small airport. Uh, so in, in the short term, what we're doing is redirecting aircraft to where the fuel is. And uh, there are limits to what we can do. So the supply, plane, uh, the, uh, the supply chain issues really relate to uh, shortage of truck drivers, uh, shortage of people to actually pump fuel into aircraft. So one capacity that we do have in our, in our toolbox is really to, is to move aircraft to where the fuel is. But 
Uh, we are examining it and trying to figure out how we can move our resources more effectively to where the fuel is. Boise is a great example. Boise doesn't depend on trucks really to, to get the fuel here. We've got fuel here. So if we have to move air tankers from Vail or from Ontario to Boise, I mean, that's an option for us because we don't have the same issues. But uh, it's an emerging issue. I, a lot of it's going to be in the governor's hands. I know Governor Little has, has he's already talked to me about it uh, before this call. And, and uh, we are trying to figure out how we can do that nationally, how we can better move our resources around to where we don't have the fuel issues that you're talking about. I, uh, Keith, I was, uh, I'm going to Coeur d'Alene Thursday, and I know one of the fixed base operations, uh, they called us. We, we've already reached, uh, reached out to ITD about what we can do as far as hours of operation, uh, fuel truck drivers. It is an issue. It's an issue. It, it's just like everything else after this pandemic. All these supply issues uh, kind of get exacerbated. But, you know, if there's anything the state can do, we'll do it. We'll do waivers. We'll do uh, everything else because we don't have that many aircraft. And if we have to move aircraft to where the fuel is, that's less time they have to be out doing what they need to be doing, and that's keeping firefighters and communities safe. James. Uh, Governor, you kind of mentioned this just now, but um, you activated the National Guard to help. Uh, what's kind of left in the tank with what Idaho can do to help uh, you know, fight any kind of fire that might well, pop up? Well, I talked to General Garshak about it, and we've got a lot more guards uh, 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 guards, men and women that are available. Uh, so uh, Josh talked about getting them trained up. Uh, we're going to continue to do that, but we're, we're going to keep our eye on and communicating with all our partners, both state and federal and local. And then if we do that, uh, we've got more, more gas in the tank, uh, uh, to use your words, not mine. Uh, we don't want to put gas on the fire, so uh, we're trying to get the fires out. But we're we we, we have more capacity at the guard. Are, are there any other resources, though, uh, aside from you know power from people? Power well, power well power. you know, really, aircraft, uh, you know, specialized aircraft, trained aircraft, and as you're well aware, uh, where, where uh, C-130s have been deployed out of Wyoming and what other state? California, California uh, C-130s uh, have been deployed, and and we'll we'll continue to look at our our Blackhawks about how, how many more of those we can deploy. Yeah. Uh, this might be a question Please. for the governor or the director. With the historic number of fires comes a historic price tag. Uh, <laughs> where, uh, was, the, was the department prepared for that, or the state prepared for that? Actually, uh, I had a. Uh, quasi budget meeting this morning. We got about 30 million. Is that right, uh, Dustin? We got about 30 million that the legislature wisely appropriated that we don't have spent, but we've spent 10. About <laughs> more than that. About uh, about 15 million. We spent about 15. Uh, but you know, as as you're well aware, we do this with deficiency warrants. Uh, there's a land board meeting next week, and and Director Miller will be reporting to us. Uh, but uh, I, I don't want to give anybody a false set of hope, but we do have a little cash in the bank in Idaho, just a little.